second service and all of you watching online this morning. Hey, before we dive into part three of our series 42, which we are super excited about, we're fired up and I about lost my voice in first service and thank God for a great girl who like handed off cough drops as I was leaving because I got three more to go. That's how fired up we are. You but just need to calm down. I know. My daughter said, mom, I think you need to calm down. I was last like, week, no. Last week we were walking out the door. I think it was like fourth service and this guy came up. It was his first time it here. It was his first time. And he said, hey. She's going to have to unwind a little bit. She is <laughs> She is no, she said, is wound really tight. He said tight. at the end of the day, does your husband have to unwind you? And I was like, kind of. I kind of like I'm on a high and then I crash. You know what I'm saying? It's like a high and then you crash. Speaking of no, crashing, but, why don't you tell him about Willie yesterday? That was funny. Oh, uh, I will in a moment. But I want to tell you, as your pastors, we did just finish our camp season and we could not be more proud of our students yeah. and all of our volunteers who have spent endless hours at camp away from their families, away from their children. I heard little kids were crying themselves to sleep because mama or daddy was away at camp. But let me tell you what an incredible impact they made up on our students this week. One girl posted this last night, and I wish I could have all 124 share what really impacted them about camps. But this morning, I'm going to share one, and I think hers probably speaks for everyone. She says this, I wouldn't normally post something like this, but this past week I felt like real life change was worth posting about. I was a little nervous to be completely off the grid for a week. No cell phone. We take their phones, guys, because there's no service anyway. She says no cell phone, no volleyball or basketball practice. How many of our students, tons of our students, gave up their practices this week, which literally meant when they come back, there's going to be consequences. Coaches were like, you can go, but when you come back, you're going to have to make up all your conditioning because you missed and you have to earn your spot, all right? They sacrificed a lot. No way to contact my parents. Church camp was a very big thing that was talked about at Mountain Movers Church. This was her first year, by the way. I knew that it had to be fun, and I knew there was something that I should be a part of, but I had no idea that my life would change so dramatically. She says some of the best speakers... An awesome band that can really get you going. It was unbelievable feeling to be at church camp. And the one who introduced her to this church and to the camp and to God, she goes on to thank them. Then she says, I got to know some very good friends, awesome friends, some of the best counselors. We had five of us girls that were there this week. She said, we played sand volleyball. I couldn't stay away. All the people that had the same intentions as I did to grow closer to God. It was a relief to know that I'm not alone and I'm not absolutely too crazy to think that I grew closer to God in an unthinkable way. I'm so grateful that I decided to go to camp and I'm already counting down the days until next year. It was such a life-changing experience and I can't believe it's taken me this long to come around. That is just one of our high school students. You can give God a hand. I cannot tell you the impact that summer camp makes. You hear us go on and on and on about it for months leading up to it and you think your pastors are nuts but you know what I went to camp from the time I was seven and I still go to camp and I'm 40 years old to this day and it impacted my life so great because every summer you would get a go and they would just have God poured into you so much it fired you up to go back to school and I can tell you that Accelerate Student Ministry is ready to go back into their schools into Grove and Wyandotte and Seneca and Matt County and make an impact this year give them one more big hand Amen well, before I forget, I got to tell this story about Pastor Willie because it was so oh, funny. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. So, I mean, when you, when you serve as, as a counselor or worker, you're there all week. You're a little, you get you a little sleep bit sleep very little. deprived, and you kind of load up on multiple legally addictive stimulants to keep you going. And by the time you get back... Hold on. Can I break in? I don't yeah. know if she's here or not, but our camp director, Miss Shelby, I got there on Tuesday morning, and I came up to her, and I was talking to her, and she was like, I've already had five cups of coffee. I'm like... It's the second day of camp. She's like five. I'm like, you are going to have to calm down. She's like, I got to keep my eyes open. Because you go, you go to bed, you know, you just run them all day long. You go to bed, it's lights out at midnight, but really about 1.30-ish. Yeah. Uh, is when, really when everybody kind of winds down. And then counselors get up at six and you do it all over again. And right. so, uh, you know, it's just a great time. But Pastor Willie, uh, bless his heart, man. He was in our office uh, yesterday, came by, he had some work to do here at the church. They set up for a new series in the back. Uh, and he walks in, and, and Courtney's telling us all about this new, you know, the, the stage set and, and the new cabinets and the shelves and the nursery. And, and Willie's just like, yeah, so, I mean, just so many lives have changed. Camp is awesome. It's just. He literally fell asleep, fell asleep setting talking. up in a chair. He fell asleep talking. 
sitting across the table. I mean, mouth open, like. I was like, and then we go, wow. Hey, Courtney, just just go ahead and take him home. I think he's, I think he's done. I think he's done. <laughs> he's done. So, so um, you know, we're just we're so thankful for the for the counselors, the workers, the campers that um, that allow God to change their lives, and so we're grateful to be a part of that. All right, so we started this new series a few weeks ago, and we're going to dig right in. And for those of you that haven't had the chance to get in on this series, this is unique. This is different. Misty and I have never done a series like this because it really stems from something personal that God spoke to our hearts, something very supernatural, something very um, miraculous, something very prophetic uh, that he spoke to us about nine years ago that at first didn't make any sense. It started with an email uh, account that I opened up and uh, when I had searched for hours to land on the perfect personal Gmail account I came up with bthelton42 at gmail.com and I was so irritated because I'm OCD for G-O-D I want everything to be you know you know me I, I like I like things to just make sense and especially numbers I want to be like a, a number that I had in school like when I played Your birthday or birthday, sports anything number or that something. means something to me but 42 meant nothing to me but I finally settled on it I submitted it and when I did that the Lord immediately said spoke to my heart he said 42 is very significant it's going to mean something really really big when you turn 42 years old I'm like what so I thought, okay, I'm starting going down the bucket list. All these things that I want to see happen. Maybe this will happen when I'm 42. Maybe this will happen. Then eventually I come all the way around and realize, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. What if I'm going to die when I'm 42? What if this is it? What if the Lord is, is kind enough in his generosity to tell me ahead of time, nine years ahead, I'm giving you nine years, buddy. You better make the most of it. And then when you're 42, you're going to die. Now I know. I'm not going to turn 43 until November, so I might die. I don't know. But if I do, I'm ready. I'm ready, but I think we know what it is. I think we know what it means. So, you know, we start digging around and looking at the significance of 42 in Scripture. Hold and on. Something you kind of left out. If you were here in part one, so for nine years, we've seen the number 42, yeah, the number 42 pop up popping up everywhere, everywhere, everywhere from, I mean, driving down the road to pumping gas. It's 42. I mean, it lands everywhere to the point that it got honestly annoying annoying okay now i hate to say that god can be annoying but it was a little bit annoying because we were like why don't you just tell us what, what it, it means. means all right nine years in and he just revealed it a few weeks ago all right so i turned 42 in november so here i am 42 and uh, a couple weeks ago you know we're we're shooting off an email to a um to a contractor because he's asking what the square footage is of the new building and so we're like, it's 60 feet by 70 feet. It's 4,200 square feet. And we're like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's the building. It's the building. It's, it's what God wants to do in and through the building. It's what the result of the building, what the building's going to produce. It's the building, 4,200 square feet. So all of these die. signs for nine years, about 42, then we realize, whoa, God, you are doing something so very, very huge. So we look into Scripture, and we gave some examples the first week. I'm going to give you a few of those again just to kind of get you up to speed. In Joshua 4 and 5, uh, we see this is the 42nd time that Joshua's name is referenced in the Bible, but it's also on their way crossing the Jordan River to their 42nd and final encampment before something really big happens, before they inherit the promised land. So I'm just going to tell you right now, out of the chute, right at the beginning of the message, what 42 means in Scripture. A lot of things stem from this one idea. It is your moment of arrival. For the children of Israel, they had circled in the desert for 40 years. Then finally, after 42 times of camping, God hands them the promised land, the land that he had promised them. In Acts 10 and 45, we see the moment of arrival for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit arrives and he fulfills the promise of his outpouring, not just for the Jews, not just for those chosen people of God, but also for the Gentiles, those who are not Jews. He arrives, the Holy Spirit arrives and says, I'm fulfilling my promise that my spirit, that salvation is for all people, not just the Jews. So we see a moment of arrival, but in it we also see a promise coming to pass. In Revelation 42, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. Man, we see 42 all over Revelation. In that first verse, we, we see this angel of the Lord, and he's given instructions, all right, to measure three different things. To measure the uh, 
time, he measures time, with 42 months of a, um, a, a demonic spirit that's released on the earth, that's three and a half years, a time of temptation and struggles against God's people. But then there's 42 months of, of God's word going forth where there's two witnesses. I know I'm going really deep, really fast, but just stick with me, all right? There's two prophets, and they're preaching the word of God for 42 months, and God's word is going forth. So we see 42 months of preservation. Uh, but then also we see this angel of God using this measuring stick. All right, now you and I in America, we use this thing called a foot or a ruler. Every time we measure something, it's in feet, right? Well, they measured everything in reeds or rods. So every time the, the angel would, would lay down that rod to measure the temple of God, which has not been built yet, all right? I know, I know this is deep, but just follow me. One day there's a temple that we will be built Ezekiel's temple. It's not been built yet, and it will be a temple that will allow us complete access to God's presence. It's a promise that God gave us many, 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 many years ago, but that rod that he measures the temple with in scripture is made of 42 hand breadths. So every time he lays that rod down and measures so many rods with so many rods length, it's 42, 42, 42, 42, 42, all over this temple. It's crazy. He also uses this measuring rod to measure the condition and the hearts of God's people to see where they're at spiritually. So 42 is huge in Scripture, and we, and, and we see the promises of God. We see the arrival of God's promises all over through these passages of Scripture. So for us, what does that mean? It means God has said, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, nine years ago, the same year that God showed, gave me that weird email, it's the same year that we poured the foundation for the room that you're sitting in right now. And for those of you who don't know, under this carpet, it, every square foot of this sanctuary is covered in wheat grain that miraculously appeared in the concrete truck. Every square foot. And in, and in the Bible, uh, wheat grain is symbolic of the harvest, which is symbolic of souls coming to Christ. People who are hurting and broken and helpless they need Jesus, and he gave us a promise years ago that he was going to fulfill his purpose and his plan by bringing people from the north, south, east, and west to come to him in great numbers. Now, I don't know if you notice this or not, but we're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we are absolutely in nowhereville, USA. You did not there, pass there, much there, getting to us. There's nothing around here. But God has somehow miraculously brought people to this church like crazy. I'm telling you right now, you wouldn't realize this because you're, you're in one of four services. But I'm telling you, there's, there's any, every given month, there's between five to 700 people that are in this room. There's two to 400 people that consistently watch on Facebook Live. Hey, Facebook Live, love you guys. Thanks for watching. Two to 400 people. That's over 1,000 people every single month that's hearing the life-changing hope of Jesus Christ in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere. That's only God. So you got to know that's not Brad Misty. you got to know that's God. God is fulfilling His promise. Today's message is all about withstanding something very important that happens to us all. When we go after the promises of God, something happens happens. What happens? Okay, before we dive into that, and I tell him the title for part three, this was just his introduction, so he's fired up. All right, you left out one part. So Revelation chapter 11, the, the verse one, room. it is actually a reference to Ezekiel chapter. Okay. Don't say it. So, I know, shut up. Okay. <laughs> you are here, so I was studying. Gosh. I was studying. I could, every time, I, the, the more I study about this 42 thing, other things pop up, and it leads me somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else. So yesterday I was looking through the commentaries, uh, studying Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1, and it talked about how this temple that the angel was measuring was referencing Ezekiel's temple. And the reference scripture that it sent you to from that verse to go look at where Ezekiel talked about it, was Ezekiel chapter, guess, 42. It's all, it just, it's God. It's God. It's supernatural. Over it's mysterious. And over and over. And honestly, it's crazy. you know, you think as pastors, we wouldn't be shocked at how God works, but Brad was like freaking out. And I'm like out. on a computer over there and I'm just focused and he's like, oh my gosh, it sent me to 42. Like, can you believe 
because it's like every week Out of God all the is chapters even in Ezekiel exactly. sent me to 42 that just so happens to be explaining the temple and that and you look at that one and, and you that start is studying a promise the temple, to come 42 42 42 42 42 all over Ezekiel's temple it's That's full right. of those measurements of those 42 hand breaths all over the temple oh, I, let me tell you one more thing okay good yes I would love for you to tell us one more thing so there is a there is a uh, a room that is attached to the it is attached to the north side of the temple sanctuary. And it is a place where the priests are to consume uh, the three different offerings. There's a sin offering and a trespass offering, but then there's also a grain offering. And the, and the priests are to eat the grain or the wheat that is given as offerings for the temple. It is on the north side of the temple sanctuary where the wheat is consumed. This is east, <laughs> that's west, that's south. This room is north. It is attached to the temple, the sanctuary, where we are about to worship God in just a few months. This room is full of wheat grain. 42. It's amazing. Supernatural, mysterious, that's how God works. But don't miss this. 42 is all about his promised Arrival. All right. We've kind of went deep. We went into a lot. But understand this. 42 is all the symbolism is about God's arrival of his promise that is to come. And here's what I want you to understand today. Is any time God lays out a promise for your life or for the church in general, any time he lays out a promise, you can believe that the enemy is going to make it his personal mission, his priority to prevent the promise from coming to pass. Anytime you begin to pursue God's purpose or God's plan for your life, the enemy makes it his mission to intervene and prevent. So today in part three, what we are going to look at is why the attack, what the attack literally is that begins to happen in your life and how you can withstand it until the promise actually comes to pass. All right. So this morning, I want you to understand very clearly why the attack happens. And again, it happens not if the enemy is going to attack you, but when. Don't miss that. All right? If you're taking notes, write it down. It's not if you're going to be attacked. Like, you know what? I gave my life to Jesus. I'm so excited. Like, they talk about this attack all the time. I don't really think it's going to happen to me. I'm on this high. No, 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 no. I don't mean to have, like to pop your bubble here, but it's not if you're going to be attacked. It is when you are going to be attacked. And let me tell you why. Because every time you take a step closer to your purpose and God's plan for your life, you get closer to the promises and the favor and the blessings of God being poured out on you. And the enemy wants to stop it. All right? So whether you give your life to Christ and then the enemy says, you know what? There's a target now on them. I'm going after them. If you're new and you said, you know what? I gave my life to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, like all this crazy stuff started happening to me. It was like all hell broke loose. I thought it was supposed to be peace and joy and overflowingness. And I feel like I'm being massively attacked. Or maybe for some of you, you said, you know what? I keep hearing this thing about the tithe, that God's ask us to give our first, our tenth. And so I've decided to take that challenge. And as soon as we started tithing, it was like everything was unleashed on our finances. Everything started breaking down. All the bills got higher, whatever. You feel this massive attack. For others, you say, you know what? I'm tired of just being a consumer. I want to be a contributor. I want to step out and start serving. I want to help make an impact. And the day you sign up to start serving and you get going on that, all of a sudden, all this craziness begins to happen. It's simple. It's an attack was launched on your life because you st took a step closer to your purpose. You took a step closer to God's plan for your life. And so the enemy's job is to put some pressure on you to make you want to quit. All right? And so some of you, you think to yourself, yeah, man, that was me. Like, as soon as I took that step, I felt that pressure, and then I backed off. And he's like, score, on to my next one. Today, we're going to teach you how to not take that step back, but to put your shoulders back and continue to move forward. How many of you guys are competitive people? Come on now. Man, at camp, it comes out. Like, that's why you have no voice. You come back. It's like, we are so competitive. And it's a drive inside of me. Like, I am not going to lose. And if I do, I will die trying to win. And that's the kind of determination you have got to have on the inside of you when it comes to the supernatural and to the spiritual. Because God's got a promise for your life. And he's got a promise for this church. But together, as Jake and Lisa talked about last week, we have to bind together. Now, this church, as well as the universal church, has two types of people in it. 
All right, type number one is this. You tell me who you are, but just right here in your brain, okay? Hey, you might want to move your toes back just okay. a little bit. It's going to hurt. Actually, Brad was like, you were kind of hard. Kinda, you were kind of mean. I'm, like, I'm not hard. <laughs> like, I love you. Okay, number one is this. Two types of people. The first one is this. You're a contributor. What's a contributor? It's somebody who is pursuing God's purpose and his plan for their life. You are trying in any way possible to make an impact on God's kingdom. So you're involved. You're giving your tithe. You're serving. You're doing whatever to be a contributor. Listen, if you're a contributor, you have a target on your head. Why? Because you are a threat to the kingdom of hell. You are a threat to the enemy. So you've got a target. You've got to know that. You've got to learn how to do battle. But the second one, listen, it's a little bit easier for you if this is you. You're Number good. two, you're good. <laughs> you're a consumer. All right, a consumer is one who's just reaping the benefits, you know? Just kind of rolling on in here, not really impacting anybody, but getting fed, okay? There's no target on your head if you're a consumer because the enemy doesn't feel like you're a threat. But if you are a contributor, you are a threat. And today, that's who I'm talking to. And for those of you who'd say, ooh, I'm probably a consumer, then I'm going to hope to inspire you to be a contributor because I want you to be a part of the promise. I want you to be fulfilled in your life as you realize that I am a part of the reason that those doors open and that people are coming from the north, south, east, and west and giving their life to Christ and having a radical life change because I am helping to make an impact. All right, this morning we're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 4. In this series, we've been talking about Nehemiah rebuilding the wall. This is the wall that was around Jerusalem. It had been down for 90 years. Say 90 years. God promised all these years earlier that if his people would return to him, that he would send them back home because they'd been exiled due to their disobedience. He says, I will bring you back. I will not only rebuild the temple that Ezra actually led the, the, to rebuild, but he says, I'll also rebuild the walls, the protection around my people. So he sends Nehemiah back. And Nehemiah, we've been talking about the last couple weeks, he goes back and he rallies the people, man. He fasts, he prays. They start building. Every family building right in front of where they live. Jake talked about it last week. But you know what begins to happen, all right? Can I jump in real quick? Yes. Okay. So understand that the fulfillment of the wall being built for them is, is their moment of arrival. That's right. And God promised, he promised that him. he would make them a people again, that he would restore the nation. But there was a moment of arrival. They had a 42 coming, and it was yeah. when that wall was complete. Exactly. That's why the enemy is, was fighting so hard to help it, to prevent it from coming to pass. That's right. So in chapter 4, verse 1, we see Sanballat comes on the scene. You can go there in your word. It said Sanballat was very angry when he learned that they were rebuilding the wall. Why? He's the enemy, okay? He's from Samaria. He leads the Samarian army. He flew into a rage and he began mocking the Jews. Here's what I want you to understand. When you first begin to walk out your purpose, you start taking that step towards Jesus. What begins to happen is that the enemy just starts kind of nagging just a bit. People start mocking you. People start honestly like, really? Like you're going to be one of those like church people? Like you went to church? Like are you really trying to drop that addiction? Why? Like we've always, like we've always done that. Why would you want to stop saying that? Why would you want to stop doing that? People start like throwing these things out, kind of mocking you, okay? That's how it kind of starts. But it doesn't stop there, okay? This guy, he starts mocking the Jews, and he's basically saying, there's no way you are going to rebuild a wall that is 8 foot wide by 39 foot high. We're talking about a massive wall. He mocks them, but listen to this. In verse 6, it says this, At last the wall was completed to half. Say half. It was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. Now listen, when you start something new, You can get excited, right? Man, we've been working on this thing. When we first started the plans, it was super exciting. We launched the campaign. This is our time back in October. That was super exciting. The building starts going up, and you know what begins to happen? We go to four services, and sometimes people start getting a little bit tired. Your finances are getting a little bit pressed because I don't know if you're aware, and if you're not, you need to be aware. This is not a building we went in debt to build. This project is being done in cash by you, the people of God's house. All right? So you start getting a little bit pressed and a little bit tired. That's what happened. Sam Bell said, okay, okay, enough with the mocking. Now we're going to go full force. He brings in the army. And literally, Nehemiah says, listen to me, everybody. Listen to me. That's what we're telling you today. An all-out attack has been launched on you and your family. Strap on your sword. Work with one hand. 
fight with the other. We will not lose this battle. We will finish the wall. We will see our promise come to pass of this wall being completely put up. He goes on then. It goes on from there. And Sam Ballot says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use some trickery here. He sends a note down to Nehemiah. And the note basically says this. I want you to come and meet me up on this hill. I want to have a talk. Like, I want to just discuss this new wall that's being built. Well, Nehemiah knew you're an idiot. Like, you are the enemy. There is no way I'm leaving this wall and coming chatting with you. And he says this, my work is too great. I am not coming down. I will not be distracted. Everybody say distracted. The enemy wants to distract you. He wants to wear you down. But listen, what happens? In verse 10, it says this, then the people of Judah began to complain. Say, complain. Come on, don't complain. The workers are getting tired. There's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. The people got about halfway, and they got tired. And the attack is meant to do what? Put pressure on your life. The attack is meant to make you not take another step forward, but be like, I'm stepping back here. Like, I was trying to go all out for Jesus, but now I'm going to take a little step back because I'm getting my butt whooped right now, okay? That's what was happening in their mind. They're like, I'm done with this. I'm tired. But Nehemiah rallies around him, and this is what he says. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember. Say remember. Remember the Lord who is great and gracious and fight. Listen to me. The same thing that Nehemiah was telling them we need to understand today. You may be kind of tired. Some of you, if you are a true contributor in this church, you are being attacked. You may be tired in your spirit. You may be tired in your physical body. You may have almost no voice because you've given everything you have for weeks to pour into students at a camp. But let me tell you something. We're not giving in. This building will go up. We will see the promise of his arrival. We will see the souls come to him. Why? Because we're not going to quit no matter what the enemies attack. The battle is real. Guys, the bat- and like Misty said, if you're, if you're one of those contributors, you've experienced this battle, you're feeling this battle, and here's how the enemy comes in. He's going to attack your relationship with God first and foremost. He's going to do everything he can to drive a wedge between you and your relationship with God because when you get in a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus, you become, you become detrimental to the demonic forces. You become this, this, this ticking time bomb that just, just grips the enemy with fear. So he's going to attack your personal relationship. He's going to bring temptation your way. He's going to test you. He's going to do everything he can to get you to fall in your relationship because he knows that's going to drive a wedge between you and God. And he knows that when we drive that wedge between us and God in our relationship, then that means that we pass up the promises of God. So you have to stay vigilant to be holy. To, 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 um, to use the words that God wants you to use, to think how God wants you to think, to do what God wants you to do. The other way that he's going to attack you is, is with distractions. Um, he is going to try to do everything he can to try to lure you away from fulfilling the promises of God. He's going to do everything he can to bring depression into your life. Another way the enemy works is he likes to keep you really, 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 really busy. He attacks our time. He'll, he'll figure out everything he can do to make you so busy that you don't have time to be the contributor that God's calling you to be. He's going to do everything he can do to bring stress and pressure to your life. He's going to attack you physically. I can't tell you how many people have been physically attacked. Leaders in this church have been physically attacked. There's a few that have been given diagnosis, diagnoses in the last two or three weeks that would just shut anybody down. I'm telling you right now. And that's a total attack of the enemy. In fact, these you know, these individuals were sitting in the doctor's offices and, the, and both doctors in both situations said, I don't know why you're not freaking out right now. And they're like, well, we know what it is. This is a total attack of the enemy because we're a part of something way bigger than ourselves. And so this is just expected. And you know what? It's the reality. The, the battle that we're facing, the battle that we're fighting, it is not physical. It's not a physical fight. Look at what Ephesians 6 and 12 says. It says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. When you become a contributor, when you step out and you do everything to make an impact, to to create this ripple effect in the kingdom of God so that more people can know him in a real way and come to Christ, I'm telling you right now, the enemy begins to put the hammer on. But there's really, really good news. We don't lose. The fight is fixed. 
So point number three, as we wrap up today, how do you withstand the attack? This is what you really need to know. This is what you really need to get deep down in your heart because you know what? You need to have that tenacity that says, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving in. I'm not getting distracted. It's not about how I feel. All right. We've all gone through all of those things that we listed as your pastors. We've been massively attacked since we launched into this whole mess. I can't tell you the amount of days where we just wanted to say, we're done. (laughs) Brandy can pastor this church. You know what I'm saying? Like, we'll pass it off. She's our top person. Like, here you go. We don't want to do this anymore. But you know what? We have to know in our mind when the attack comes, it's not about how I feel. It's not about whether I feel like coming in and serving or coming in and worshiping. It's about the feeling inside that you know that God's promise is actually going to come to pass. So you're going to withstand. How do you do it? You remain. John 15 says this, if you will remain in me, it means something you have to decide you're going to do. If you will remain in me, I will, it's a promise, I will remain in you and you will bear much fruit. You have to learn how to remain. Some of you need to learn how to just take that step to get to that point. You need to get into God's presence. You got to realize that when your morning opens, attack is on. When your feet hit the floor, what you want the devil to say is, oh crap, they're up. You know what I'm saying? Not because you're so busy, the alarm doesn't go off, you're rushing out, but no, 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 because you've got a habit in place, and you get up, and you get in your word, and you begin to take it in, and you begin to say, God, I'm going to remain in you today, no matter what I face. I'm going to turn on worship, and I'm going to worship you, because I realize that I've got to be surrounded by your presence, because it's only through you that I'm strong enough to withstand this attack. You've got to get on your knees, and you've got to begin to pray, and I want to show you what happened just this week as our students begin to realize what it is like when you get in God's presence. These guys are ready for the attack. Check this out. to this craziness. When I raise my hands and I begin to sing out to God, all of a sudden, God's presence just swoops down and I get this incredible feeling of God's presence wrapped around me and I feel like I could take on the entire world. Why? Because I'm going to worship my way through that battle. It says, I may, you may think that I'm surrounded. The enemy wants you to think that he's got you surrounded on every side, but here's what's really happening is I'm surrounded by you, God, because I'm in your presence. The only way you are going to withstand this battle and you're going to be here when the promise happens, the only way, because the enemy's picking people off, I'm telling you right now. You can probably look around and see some people that you saw six months ago that are not in this room right now. Why? Because the enemy has been trying to take people out. Don't give in. Don't give up. You're going to have to learn to get in God's presence yourself. I can't do it for you. I will pray for you. You got to do it yourself. You got to learn how to withstand so that the promises and the favor of God can be poured out upon your life as well. James 1 and 12 says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will say will. They will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Guys, the enemy may have been, may, may be attacking your marriage right now. He might be trying to bring division in the church. I, I can tell you right now, last week, Jake and Lisa preached an incredible timely message for this series about being unified as a body of believers. Because if he can bring dissension and division among families in the church, listen, we are the church. He's not going to try to destroy the building, right? We have insurance. He's not going to try to do that. What it, the, ch- the church is the people. Right. He's going to try to bring dissension and division among yeah. us. And so a house divided against itself cannot stand. So, so more than ever, we have to link arms. We have to be right. unified. We have to be that energy and motion saying every step of the way, saying, God, we are going to be who you want us to be. Right. We are going to do what you want us to do. And we are going to see your promise come to pass for your moment of arrival for revival. Do you know how many churches across America of every denominational background are constantly praying that their churches would grow. Do you know this? It's this word called revival. It's not some mystical out there thing. It is when a church is growing supernaturally. God is bringing people. And guess what? We're not praying for revival. We're in it. God's doing it. 
He's doing it. This is the fulfillment of his promise that he promised years ago. So I'm saying, hold on. Hold on real tight because God's taking us on a ride. And I don't think he's even gotten started yet with what we're about to see him do. So remain steadfast. Be, be diligent. Be persistent. Persevere. Don't give up. Don't get distracted. More than ever, this is the time for you to pursue God, to be the person he's called you to be. Because when you do that, we're not only going to see his promise come to pass for many people to come to Christ, but God is going to fulfill the promises in your life when you begin to push in and you begin to pursue your purpose in him. Let's pray today. Father, in the name of Jesus. I just pray, God, right now for such a time as this, God, that we would push, that we would persevere, that we wouldn't give up, that we wouldn't give in. God, that we would do everything within our power as we approach this moment of arrival that you have set aside for us, the promise that you've given us, God, so many years ago, not just as a church, but as individuals. There's so many promises that you have for so many people in this congregation, Father God. And I pray now more than ever that we would be steadfast. God, that we would remain in you until the promise comes to pass. Help us, God, to be fully clothed in the armor of God, to fight with faith, to be who you've called us to be, God. Help us to remain strong in you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, you might be the very type of person that this whole church exists to serve. You might be the very reason why we do church. You might be a person that would say, you know, I don't have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus, but I want to make heaven my home. If that's you, you have come to the right place, and God has brought you here for such a time as this. If you're in this room or you're watching on Facebook Live, listen to me very carefully. You and I are sinners in need of a Savior. And we have to admit before God that we have sinned and that we've fallen short of His glorious standard. We have to ask Him to forgive us of our sins. And when we do that, then we believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We confess Him as Lord of our lives. And we make the commitment from this moment forward that even though we're going to continue to make mistakes, we're going to do everything within our power to live for Him and to please Him in everything we say, do, and think. So if that's you today... I just want to encourage you with heads bowed, eyes closed. This is your moment. This is your moment of arrival right now. If that's you, we're going to pray together as a church family, but I want to know who we're praying with. Would you just raise your hand if that's you today? Come on. If you're watching online, just type I'm all in in the comment section below. We want to know who you are as well. Come on. I see your hand. Anybody else today? Come on. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. In honor of those and in support of those who have made this life-changing, eternal decision, we're going to pray together as a church. Would you pray with me? Father, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Please forgive me. I confess Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is the Lord of my life. I will live for you, God, from this day forward, never to be the same again. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, if you just made that decision, that is the best decision you will ever make in your life. And it's why we get up every morning and do what we do. We have a gift we want to celebrate by giving you. It's called your Next Step Kit. It's on the left as you exit. You can get it if you're in house. And if you're online, direct message us your address and we will have one in the mail for you in the morning. It's got a brand new Bible and a message from Brad and I. And if you want to hear the message, you can also text Life Change to 555 888. This is going to help you on your newfound journey. Will you guys put your hands together for all of those who just made that incredible decision? Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. 
We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.